All right, this is JP Miller with the JPZ DevX DevRel Super Hour. We're just talking about the news and themes going on in the past week. I'm trying to do a theme. I'm broadcasting live on the YouTubes, and we're doing the Twitter spaces at the same time. So this is the second time doing this, my first time on Twitter spaces. We'll see how it goes. This is one of those things where getting started is the hardest part. I think I've been playing with things for the last hour and have finally just just had to get just had to get getting started is the hardest part. I even looked for a quote about it that I could open up with and, and nothing. So I guess they didn't start that. This reminds me of a story about rolling rolling a rock. I mean, this is like an old Greek mythology, but and a lot that's very common. So like going beyond that, there's like three stages of life. The first stage is where nothing's happening nothing's going on and you want to get started so it's just getting that rock or you could think of it as a flywheel started and getting it moving and then the second stage is once things are moving you want to keep them moving and keep them moving forward and the whole goal of that state is just to keep things moving forward and then the third state is when the rock starts going backwards or if the flywheel breaks the whole goal is just to get it stopped to stop from going backwards so you can resume going forwards and and oftentimes getting getting started is the hardest part is it a Jim Collins in good to great he talks about this flywheel principle and probably in earlier books he, he talks about and he really defines the flywheel principle and the more revolutions that you do with the flywheel, the easier it gets. It's really just about iterating. He's got a, an acronym for it. And of course it's slipping my mind at the moment, but the whole idea is to, I, I've got like a beaver in my mind. It's, it's some kind of a, an animal analogy that he has, but the whole idea is just to do the simplest things that you can to move that flywheel forward and to keep it as simple as possible, as long as possible to keep those rotations on actually spinning my hands here and that will that will create your your flow so that's that that's that's what we do um let's get into the news so i just want to talk to you about some tech news and relate that to developer experience developer relations wherever possible I need to get my brain i don't know how many of you out there use a second brain use like I've, I've got a second brain on notion that I use and it's absolutely wonderful. Um, definitely, definitely is like a brain saver. It helps with just like organizing your thoughts and let's get into it. So the first, the first thing on, on my list today is this report from Coindesk talking about a 16 Z. Um, working on an optimism based role the thing that was interesting for me about this was that they're they're going to rust for their optimistic roll-up and they said that this will make it more accessible for developers uh, that the the rust will, will be more accessible and i thought oh this is interesting um how many rust developers are there and so if rust is like a a new low level programming language like compared to like C++. You've got C++ here with about 22%. This is from Statistica or Statista um, for the 22 year of 22 records. About 22% of developers say they use C++ and less than half, 9.32% of developers say they use Rust. And it's actually even less than Go. It looks like Go and Rust are neck to neck there. Um, where Go is at 11.15%. So I thought that was an interesting validation for why to choose Rust. Uh, my my personal thought is that it's probably uh, more accessible than like Solidity, especially if your your goal is to attract Web2 developers over to your platform to develop with you. Um, I would like to see 
more Web3 domain specific languages, right? High level Web3 domain specific languages, low level domain specific languages, and machines, so operating systems, blockchain operating systems. And that's what I would like to see for developers to give developers in the Web3 space as many tools as possible and to give them the start that they need to develop applications quickly and securely. Okay, so that's that's going on. That was interesting. Um, Apple is turning out a journal application. Let's see if I've got that pulled up here. So Apple, Apple does this. They will... Um, take the most popular apps in the app store and then they they just kind of say we're going to we're going to do that that's a great idea we're going to do that thing so they're set to up um, to introduce a journaling app in the next ios update so i believe it was ios 17 and we're going to have a journal app so that would be interesting there is there is this wisdom out there about analyzing every day at the end of each day and having having a tool like that on your iphone and what well, there's a like everlast is a popular note-taking app um where are some others that they day one is the app that they mentioned here is popular i imagine if i was working at day one i would be very nervous if i was leadership in day one i would be quite nervous about this development and what that's going to mean and then probably begin to focus more on Android. That is, it's like the double-edged sword about having a successful app on Apple. You really don't know when Apple's going to decide to just take that, take that idea, incorporate it into their platform. It's great for accessibility for the users, maybe not for companies and, and that's a conversation to have this an interesting conversation, right? Like how, how is what's better for innovation? Should it all be under the umbrella of, of one large company that provides these services as part of what you've paid for? And there's, there's not an additional subscription fee, which is nice. Um, there's not an additional purchase, which is nice. Does, does, the large company have the wherewithal, the capability, and the desire to continue updating those apps for the long term in the same way that um, maybe not necessarily a, bo a boutique is interested in updating, but you know a larger company like like Day One. So that's that's interesting. So this idea, since we're talking about journaling, there's you know, there's there's some wisdom out there about reflecting at the end of each day, taking time to think about the events of the day and judge that against your goals and the criteria that you had for yourself. So six questions you can ask yourself or in 20 minutes before you go to bed. And here they are given to you for free. What did I accomplish today? Just think about, hey, what, what did I do? If you can journal it, I think it's, it's even better. Is you just create more of a record in your mind for that. Second question is, what could I have done better? But you, can, you can do this in your head all the same. Did I learn something new today? It's going to be very important in the age of AI, uh, learning something new every day and really carving out space in the day to learn something new and to be intentional about what you're learning. Did I act in line with my values and beliefs? You know, we all have off days. Um, was it was it a day when you were aligned with your values and beliefs? Um, and then it's also an opportunity to to reassess those values and beliefs and make sure that they they are still they still fit you um, and and to take time to to assess them. So it's not just like a, a doctrine blindly followed, but it is something that is very meaningful and productive to your life in this current moment. Number five is, am I grateful for today? There are, we have bad days, but maybe even if on a bad day, is there some small nugget? Is there some 
thing about the day that you can be grateful for? And what are your priorities for tomorrow to set your up to set yourself up for success the next day? Okay, that's been the JP therapy minute. Moving off of that and away from Apple now on to our next story. So Apple, Google. Oh, this is an interesting one. So Google, Google campus is on hold. Let me pull this up. And I think I have a note on here about that. Yes, about the Alphabet CEO and the Google campus being on hold. So this is this is interesting. Let me pull that up on the screen. All right, Google Google's mega campus is on hold for at least a year. The whole thing is like a 10 to 30 year timeline to complete the mega campus, which is really fascinating. And these like long term projects, we don't talk about these kind of things very often. So we were watching Lord of the Rings and, you know, in that first movie, and spoiler alert, if you haven't seen it yet, this is actually my first time going, finally watching these things. The the Fellowship of the Rain uh, goes goes through the Dwarven Caverns, and the thing is immense. It just is huge. It's expansive. It's you know it's like walking into a cathedral, a mega cathedral, and you know that the whole thing couldn't have been built in one lifetime. Maybe an Elf's timeline, but not. I don't, I don't think dwarves have uh, extended lifespans, certainly not in a human lifespan, right? And we don't see these kind of huge projects too much anymore. You you would see them, the pyramids, some of the, the structures that the Greeks and the Romans built over um, some e the there's temples in Asia that monks began to build knowing that they would die before it was completed, that they would never see the end. I need a little drink here. And we don't see those kind of timelines anymore. Maybe in part that's because that we can build a lot faster than we used to be able to. Um, we can build skyscrapers in, you know, years in, instead of decades. Um, so, so maybe it's, it's just, it's harder to find a project that takes a very long time like that. So I think there's something to be said for the, that long-term vision. Google is halting this project for the time being. They say it's going to be a short pause, but who knows? They're laying off. They uh, gutted their project's development team and, um, maybe it won't be at the same scale. Maybe they're going to to scale down this project. Then there's a note here about AI and BARD, and it is really interesting to see Google lose the AI war. This is certainly not a unique thought that I've had. It's been said before. We see this kind of turnover in industries. Facebook losing social media. Um, before that, it was MySpace. Google losing AI after they beat out Yahoo. Um, maybe one day Web3 beating out these centralized banks. You know, these, these are cycles and companies that are young and innovative and scrappy startups. They can move fast and do great things. They're very successful and then their success begins to kill them. It's often... In the same way that people learn habits to protect themselves in bad situations, and once they get themselves out of that situation, it's hard to let go of those habits that were learned, and instead of helping and protecting, they become hindrances to further success. So we see these, we see these kind of themes in life and in, in corporations. So it's interesting. And then another interesting note is the Alphabet CEO made $200 million in uh, salary and stock packages in 2022 they've had a number of layoffs and now they're halting this it says it speaks to the priorities of leadership leadership's priority is to pay themselves what some might call egregious sums while harming the the long-term prospects of the company itself 
it may or perhaps it indicates that leadership is less bullish on their company's future as well. As we say, they, they, that, now they would never say so in public, right? Because that would be terrible. It'd be like, um, I believe it was a Saudi financier who said that he would, he would not invest anything else into Credit Suisse. And the next day, Credit Suisse's stock price dropped 20%. And that was on a technicality because of, because of laws. But the way he said it instilled uh, or, or removed confidence that people had or what confidence people had in Credit Suisse. And now UBS owns Credit Suisse. It's very interesting, right? But money talks, money talks. And so are we seeing CEOs uh, cannibalize their own companies to get rich as an ex I mean, party rich here in this case, right? But, but cannibalizing their companies as an escape plan while the money is there to grab and hey, the rest, it's, it's sayonara, right? So that's, that's interesting. If I was giving out nickels every time I said it's interesting, I would probably be broke by now. Okay, so talking about Google and losing, losing ground, the AI race is, is, is on, right? So yeah, Google, Google Bard is a theme. I don't know who's using it. I haven't used it. I haven't even checked it out. I've checked out uh, GPT for all. I found it wanting. I've checked out auto GPT. I found it interesting and early. I've got a little tutorial to walk through. I need to finish the edits on that and get that published. And I haven't, I haven't even tried Bard. I've, I've seen some screenshots of Bard not being able to add or write some simple Python code. So that, that was enough for me, I suppose, for the time being. So AI is in the race. Um, employers are looking at our AI and how they can use AI for their companies. I just saw another report on that AI improves productivity by 14%. I bet it's actually on my LinkedIn, instead of jumping back and forth. I'll just, I'll just get it pulled up. So AI is uh, very productive, right? And we, and we can see this if you've used, you've used something like GPT, it's very helpful. You do have to check it for errors. And I found that the first, first drafts of things is, is usually quite bad, like a human. It, you need to draft through a few times, but the iteration cycle of drafting documents and creating content is much faster than solo. My concern is losing some creative muscles. So this, this might, all right, here's a prediction about AIs. With AI, we are going to see creativity schools or creativity boot camps to help re-energize those creative muscles and get you thinking for yourself again. No electronics, no AI, just you and your pen, paper, and creative thoughts. We're going to exercise those muscles and help you be the best you can be. I, I can definitely see a boutique crop like that popping up for business people, marketers, creatives, designers, product, to help people like create exercises that will help them think, uh, just help them exercise their brain, that prefrontal cortex, and especially the right side of the brain in being creative, uh, just from leaning too much on GPT and other AI tools to do the thinking for us. Let's avoid a Wally world, right? So companies have found, minority companies have found that impact is low. Going back to this report that uh, about the AI being 14% more productive, that is the lowest that number will ever be. So right now it's 14%, 14% more productive according to the study that um, I don't currently have a source for and I apologize. That number is only going to go up. I said this last week about how AI could, will begin to um, 
allow one person to do the job of many people. And the number of that many is only going to increase over time. And I was thinking about like, how are companies going to react to this? And I've been thinking about this. And I think there will be a number of companies that will react to that by, by laying off and piling work on top of people and expecting them to be able to do it with the tools. And I think that we'll see some people will adapt. They'll be able to do it. Some people will burn out, look for something else. And then there will be other companies that will, uh, let's say, have a stronger set of ethics about them and will continue to hold their personnel and train their personnel on how they can use AI and then give them the space that, say, a company like Google used to, which they don't do this anymore. They used to have that like required moonshot time. Every person gave 20% 20 of their week was for any project they wanted to work on. And we had some awesome projects. The most popular one is Gmail that came out of that principle, out of that policy. You will see companies exercise similar policies where they'll say, hey, do what you want, 20, 40% of your time, whatever you'd like to do, go for it. Just let us know, have reports, you know, they'll, they'll have scaffolding to for for people to share what they're working on and we are going to see massive innovations come out of those companies that are fostering their people that are caring for their people and helping them explore what is possible with this new technology and those companies that are trying to operate the old way one will get terrible reviews on systems like Glassdoor or less than desirable reviews terrible is probably like an exaggeration a uh, bit of hyperbole and be, begin to be just less innovative because the people people are still maxed out in what what they can do in a day and their obligations and there won't be that room for creativity and they'll become the dinosaurs and they'll be ushered out and deservedly so okay let's move on to the the next story here so twitter elon musk has got to stay in the news in this case it's i guess yeah i mean twitter it's like twitter and elon they're synonymous at this point it is it is ridiculous that like wh whatever you think of elon musk whatever i think and it's it's complicated you know it's like full disclosure the the thoughts are complicated and nuanced as as life is and as our thinking processes should be It is a shame that one person can go in and buy an entire company that people rely on for all sorts of things. I'm in tech Twitter and crypto Twitter, but there are, there are people who don't care about tech or crypto at all, right? They, there's other, other realms of Twitter, and they're affected by these things as well. And I imagine that they would rather not be. Uh, these, it is getting to a point where a lot of tools that we rely on for the internet should be public goods in the same way that we think of our electric or gas or water companies. These are public utilities. Tools such as Twitter, search engines such as Google should be public utilities. And in 10, 15, or 20 years from now, there will be AI platforms that absolutely should be public utilities because so many people rely on these platforms, not only for their jobs and their livelihood, but just to, for information. It's so critical for information and the flow of information. So, uh, you know, there's the blue check mark. Some people hate it. Some people I see on the internets or really on the Twitter feeds saying that as soon as I see a blue check mark, they, they block. I think it's, like, I get it. I understand why they're saying that they're, they they identify a blue check mark with a certain ideology that uh, they find reportable, or I guess there's a, a good opportunity to use that deplorable word. Um, but I, I think it's I think it's small minded personally. But whatever, yeah, everyone has to uh, live their life and and be have peace, right? So. That's very important in this age is to have peace and to do what you need to have peace. I think that supersedes all. 
Elon wants you to pay the $8 a month subscription fee to be able to, to have the privilege of advertising on Twitter. I think this is, um, it is what it is. Maybe, maybe there's an $8 a month discount earmarked for advertisers. I, that would be fair. In order to advertise on my platform, you must be a paid subscriber. However, if you are a paid subscriber, I will discount you $8 a month on your advertising billing. It's a wash. It's like, okay, it's a wash. I want you to have the blue check mark. It's important for us as a platform to show that our advertisers have the blue check mark, but I'm not actually going to make you pay for it because you're already paying for us. Um, I don't see like that kind of nuance in, in this snippet, and this is just a snippet, right? So, I don't know. It's interesting. It's interesting. The I will say this: that they move very. They are moving very fast at Twitter again. It does feel like early Facebook move fast and break things. As controversial as that was, when like the things we were breaking were actually people, you know, like LGBTQ plus people who uh, were not out. And now, like, Facebook was outing those people. Like, that's, when you're breaking people, that's not good. It's not a good look to be breaking people, especially publicly. I got a, a quote that I've recently read that said, we like to torture people. We love to torture people right up to the point of getting into serious trouble by killing them. Right? So, like, it's interesting. There it is. I owe nickels again. Fortunately, uh, again, no one's watching or viewing, so I don't owe anyone nickels. Come back next week. Watch me say it's interesting next week, and I will mail you nickels. All right, moving on to the next thing. Let's get into it. So, a bit of crypto news. Um, well, it's more Web3 news. So there's a theme in blockchain where blockchain is the technology. Crypto uh, refers to the degens and the gambling and the finance side of things. And then Web3 is like the building and scaling. I am very focused on the Web3 I'd, I'd try to stay away. Like, uh, you're not going to see me go through the the charts, right? I'm not going to look at charts. I'm not going to draw lines. Not here. It's just it's just not my theme. So Binance has integrated GPT into their Web3 Academy. So here we go. It hits all my markers. This is the future of education. Um, AI is taking the world by storm. And Binance has announced that they're integrated into their education platform called Binance Sensei. And basically, it's the idea is that it's a mentor and a guide for their education platform. This is exactly my vision of how we can use AI in classrooms. A teacher augmented with AI and students using AI in responsible ways, a teacher becomes a mentor, a guide. A teacher gets to take on like a Socratic role or a pl uh, platonic role, right? Like these words come from Socrates and Plato and guide the student on the journey of knowledge. And together they have the opportunity of discovering something new or learning something new, learning it faster. There is a report that came out this week as well. I don't have it queued up for the show, but it is that Bill Gates said that we're going to be able to teach languages in 18 months with AI. Um, possibly get to a point where your 18-month-old is, is talking and uh, com complete use of language because... AI is such a great teacher that never gets tired. And like, 
Um, the way that we learn when we're small, if you've ever been around a baby or a toddler, they do things ad nauseum over and over and over again, which is fine. It's totally fine, especially when they're the ones doing it independently, right? Now, once they drag their adults into the thing, and, and I use drag, it's kind of a derogatory word here. Um, I mean, there's, there's probably like a better word with better connotations. Once they bring their adult into the plaything, an adult, we're like, okay, I did it once. I'm done. Maybe like a complicated thing right, that you haven't done before. I, I need to do it two or three or four or five or six times, but like 40 times. I remember long ago reading this report that like children will do a thing, a, a toddler, a baby will do a thing on average about 40 times before they get bored of it. Like they really want to get it in their mind that this is what happens when I push this button, bear pops up. And when I let go, bear goes back down. I go pop, pop, pop. And that's fun. And they're, they're getting something for that. And we were all like that when we were that age. And when you bring your adults into it, the adult's like, okay, next, move on. But if you have an AI, the AI is not going to get tired. Like, yeah, the AI will be in there with you. Let's do it. Let's do it again. 40 times. You want to do it 40 times? Let's do it 40 times. Cool. Having AI mentors and teachers, this is absolutely the future. There's no doubt about it in my mind and we're going to have more of it they the tools may be clunky at first uh, they may not exactly work this is the future uh crypto tracking is big business so basically just tracking records coffeezilla is going to appreciate this for sure you won't have to track everything on his own so much anymore so understanding where transactions came from and where they're going to is a huge business. There are parties uh, that are interested in these kind of things, right? Some who control finance regulations, some who control tax regulation. They want to know. Um, chain analysis is becoming an industry that is becoming uh, more mature. And in, I don't know, whatever it's going to be, 40 years from now, we'll have quantum computing that's absolutely going to break our beloved Bitcoin. Um, so that's an that's interesting development there. Companies are saying, hey, if you're stressed, we want you to take a day off. Uh, some HR professionals are starting to say, hey, if you're stressed out and you can't deal, then just take a break. You know, like let go of the day and come back when you're ready. See if your company is willing. I think this is the way. you got to take care of your people. People who are taken care of are productive, and they, are, they, are, uh, they have higher, higher rates of creating new ideas and higher productivity. Feeds shutting down. Ain't that crazy? Talking about industries turning over. 15% um, staff reduction and... The CRO is exiting, and they're they're going down. So it's end of end of an era. Remember when they were the hottest thing, and you couldn't get away from them? It was wild how fast internet companies rise and fall. And I think we have one more, one more. This this little thing that I found, this Coca conversational question answering challenger. So if you want to get involved in in AI and you're interested in Becoming an AI developer, the of course there are experts, there are mathematicians and AI technologists that have been working on AI for decades, but this is a field now that has begun to open up. And it won't always be as open as it is today. If you're interested in getting into AI, things you can do now are like, check out these COCA challenges. Get involved, play around with it and see what you can do. Look at the OpenAI evals. You can you can create your own evals with OpenAI. Check it out. Make some evals. Submit them. Make a pull request to OpenAI. And these are excellent ways that you yourself can break into artificial intelligence if you're so inclined. If you want to get into Web3, you can do that like Binance is School. There are a number of ways that you can learn Web3 development, you can start for free. 
there are a lot of, I noticed uh, another thing like that's all the rage is prompt engineering, almost like the day after GPT-3 came out, everyone was like, oh, prompt engineering is going to be the next big thing. You're going to make $300,000. I think that's BS. I think it's absolute BS. Uh, but but so say they, so say they, and so say they because it's value. It's uh, they're selling something. So again, follow the money. Watch where the money goes on these things. And if someone's selling you a product, well, why are they selling you that product? Why are they saying this thing is is going to do this thing for you? Um, when it's really not even improving yet. Here it is, learnprompting.org. But if it is a thing that you're interested in, I think getting familiar with communicating with AI, using it as a tool to help it give you the results that you want as as fast as possible is going to be a skill that that companies will use as a valuable consulting skill it's a valuable skill just for yourself as you continue on in this society that we're building, this crazy complicated society that we're, we're erecting. Um, and so one source here is learn prompting. There you go. And let's do a little zoom action. There we go. Learnprompting.org. Cool. That's the show. 